Coming up on DTNS, robots with sensitive fingers can plug in headphones now. 3D printed lightweight carbon fiber bike frames are on the way. And we try to guess the real problem with TikTok. <laughs> This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, July 13th, 2020. It's still 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer. Oh, wait. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Was... Why did you <laughs> stop? <laughs> yeah, I almost forgot sure. my name. I almost forgot. Yeah, had to name. think about it. <laughs> it's written right there. It's written right in front of you. <laughs> it's also just your name. <laughs> and it's also her name. Uh, we were just talking about new car smell and uh, the human sexuality class at Sarah and Rogers College. If you want that wider conversation, get the expanded show, Good Day Internet, at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Alphabet CEO Sundar Pichai announced that Google will invest roughly $10 billion in India over the next five to seven years. The investments will focus on expanding the internet beyond English and other vernacular languages. Google also plans to invest in artificial intelligence and education in India. The Detroit Free Press reports a second case of using facial recognition to mistakenly arrest someone in Michigan. Facial recognition was used to identify a man who was also identified by the victim in a photo lineup. So facial recognition first, then the victim looked at photos and said, yeah, that's the guy. However, video of the incident showed the perpetrator had tattoos and the arrested man that was identified by facial recognition and the victim did not have the tattoos. So an attorney took photos of the mistakenly arrested man, gave them to the victim and an assistant prosecutor who agreed, yes, we have misidentified him, and a judge later dismissed the case. Workers for grocery delivery platform Shipt told The Verge in an email that they plan to walk off the job and not accept new orders starting Wednesday, July 15th, just in two days, due to the company shifting to an algorithm-based pay structure that workers say will reduce their pay by at least 30% and sometimes in other cases higher. Shipt launched a new pay model late last year that rele uh, replaced its previous flat fee model. Politico reports that California has opened an antitrust investigation into Google. Details of what California's attorney general is investigating aren't known, but recent scrutiny has focused on the company's acquisitions dominance and conduct in the ad tech market and search markets. Those are kind of the typical things Google gets investigated for. Currently, Alabama is the only U.S. state that's not officially investigating Google. After private alpha testing over the last few months, Microsoft Flight Simulator will officially launch on August 18th for the PC with pre-orders and pre-installs starting today. The latest, the last release rather, of Microsoft Flight Simula Simulator X Steam Edition was back in 2014. Mm. It has been some time. The standard edition of Microsoft Flight Simulator will be 60 bucks with 20 planes and 30 airports. There's also a deluxe edition going for $90 with five additional planes and five extra airports and a premium Deluxe Edition includes 10 additional planes in total and 10 extra airports and priced at $120. The Supreme Court of India ruled that services of court notices, summons and pleadings and such can be done not only through email, fax, but also instant messaging and specifically mentioned WhatsApp. The court said two blue ticks in WhatsApp would convey that the receiver has seen the notice. The ruling observed that lockdowns prevent many Indian citizens from visiting the post office to receive service during the COVID-19 pandemic. In the ruling, Chief Justice S.A. Bobdi stated, we have to accept the present situation and change our mindset. Eventually, it must settle down to a system of new and old. All right, let's talk a little bit about podcasting as an industry. <laughs> oh, let's. The IAB estimates that podcast advertising revenue will rise 14.7% in 2020, which is down from the 48% it found in 2019. In a survey of advertisers, podcast ad revenue was down 16% in April, 15% in May, and 19% in June. But SiriusXM don't care because SiriusXM will pay EW Scripps $325 million to acquire podcast company Stitcher. With Stitcher, SiriusXM gets the podcast app, obviously, but also the mid-roll ad network and content networks through Earwolf. This includes Freakonomics, W2F with Mark Marin, Comedy Bang, Bang, among others. Script says that SiriusXM says Stitcher, SiriusXM Radio, and Pandora combined will reach more than 150 million monthly listeners in the U.S. alone. SiriusXM acquired Simplecast for its distribution and analytics tools last month, so it's on a bit of a hiring spree. The company is also a shareholder in SoundCloud. 
Yeah, I have to say I'm impressed by Sirius XM. Uh, I remember when they were still two separate companies, Sirius and XM, uh, mm -hmm. and I thought, well, these folks are going down. One of them's going to go out of business. The other one's going to get acquired, and that'll be the end of them because the Internet's just going to drive them out of business. Who wants a model that requires you to launch satellites? But boy, have they proven my thoughts wrong. Uh, not only did they merge to kind of you know survive for longer, but buying Pandora, buying Earwolf, buying now Stitcher, this is a company that has positioned itself well to take advantage of good content, good personalities, and say, we will continue to operate distribution models based on where people listen, you know, whether it's music, podcasts, radio shows, whatever. Yeah, as a, I, I have been a Sirius XM subscriber in the past because it has been often bundled in for a few months with a new car lease that I've gotten. And I really like the network. But it's also whenever my subscription runs out, the free version of it, I've never re-upped. Um, you know, and they'll call you and they'll send you stuff in the mail and there's emails and it's a whole thing. It's like, and you get like, it's it's the the trying to retain users model. You know, they're they're mm -hmm. they're they they're, yeah, yeah. Uh, they don't you know, want you to cancel. They, just, they don't they, they don't want yeah. you to cancel, and the, and they'll try real hard to get you back, but. You know, for me, it was always like, it's not that I don't like the network. I actually really do. Like, there's like certain, you know, music channels and, and you know, you've got you've got your Harrod Stearns and that sort of thing that would would drive lots of people to the service. But it was it always felt just a little like, I don't know, long in the tooth. So these these uh, acquisitions make a lot of sense because if the company doesn't do this sort of thing, it won't exist. Well, I imagine one of the reasons you didn't want to pay for Sirius XM is you could get radio for free over the air and you could get cool content like Sirius XM had for free as a podcast. Uh, so, the, you know, as as we switch from uh, to, to using the Internet to get more and more of our entertainment, uh, it, it, Sirius XM is positioned to take advantage of that. Stitcher will be a way that they can offer you like, oh, well, you know, we want to keep you as a user. If you really want to cancel Sirius XM, what about installing Stitcher on your on your car panel and, and using yeah. your internet connection for that? Uh, I'm curious if SiriusXM will continue to survive as a service similar to Pandora, as a you know online service, which it is. When you pay for SiriusXM, you also get online access to it. You don't mm -hmm. have to get it over the satellite. Uh, but it is also another example of the consolidation of the podcast industry as we see more and more content being associated with distribution platforms. Wasn't a big deal that SiriusXM owned Earwolf and WTF with Mark Marin until they bought Stitcher. Now it's like, oh, do these is this their Joe Rogan? Do they now make Mark Marin exclusive to Stitcher and withhold him from Spotify? Uh, or is everybody going to keep playing nice and just you know put some exclusives on their own network uh, that are perks, but still keep the majority of stuff available cross platform? We will see. Yes, we will. And and I wonder if five years from now, or or I don't know, even sooner, we'll say, gosh, remember when? Uh, podcasters weren't exclusive. Yes. Remember yeah, where you could, you could just get like the get the show any yeah. way you wanted to on any channel, you know, slash app that you liked. I don't know. MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, a.k.a. CSAIL, has built a two-fingered robotic gripper with soft pads that can handle fine objects like wires and sheets. This is something that's been very hard for robots to do because they don't have sensitive fingers. Our fingers are very good at pressure sensitivity and touch sensitivity, and robot fingers haven't been. Well, tiny cameras in the pads that use something called gel sight can detect position, orientation, and force, which was a big part of this, to adjust their pose and grip on the fly. That means the robot can hold a wire, even if you're yanking it away, they can still keep a hold of it and be able to trace that wire, say, to the end of a headphone cable to find where the jack is or to the plug is and plug it into a mini jack. They can plug in headphones, you know, the thing that no phones have anymore <laughs> as they get rid of these jacks. But the robots can finally do it. Uh, the scientists hope to expand uh, this to do things like untie knots, uh, sewing, with thread, folding cloth. Uh, you can get robots to fold cloth if you do a lot of like herky-jerky stuff with flat panels, but this would be them to say like any cloth, you could pick it up and fold it like we do. The team intends to focus its applications at first on the auto industry for things like wiring, threading cables in cars. Uh, but there are plenty of other applications you could think about, in, like including sewing could be uh, useful in medical. 
uh, for for sewing up wounds and sutures and the like. Yeah, yeah. Talk about something that has to be done extremely delicately. The, 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 these stories are. I'm always like, all right, they got a robot to do something cool, and then you watch the video and you're like, oh wow, <laughs> that is very precise. <laughs> this is really cool. Yet the the. Uh, the implications of this, you know, I, I, I guess it'll take some time for us to, to, to really understand, you know, how, how science advances because of this, but, but yeah, the, the, it's, it does seem very impressive. It's, uh, it's going to improve if, if this pans out and it becomes a, available at scale for, for cost and all the usual uh, caveats, uh, it, it stands to, uh, automate things that it can't be automated right now, thus taking away tedious work uh, from workers. There's always a fear that it will eliminate work, but I, I think that gets overstated with things like this. This will allow those workers to focus on other quality items that they can't focus on right now that the human brain is better suited to. Uh, and and so less tedious work for people, more fulfilling work for people, and possibly saving money and you know bringing down the price of cars or surgeries because the robot can take care of stuff uh, in a repetitive manner that people can't. It's better for worker health, for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> Fewer RSI injuries. I'm into yeah. it. Right. The register notes that IBM's Global Technology Services posted a job advertisement which called, among other things, for a minimum 12-plus years experience in Kubernetes administration and management. That would mean that candidates would have started working with Kubernetes in 2008 or earlier, 12 years plus. But that's a tough qualification to meet because Kubernetes stated with its first GitHub commit on June 7, 2014. Hmm. A similar observation came from Sebastian Ramirez, who saw a job posting asking for four plus years experience with Fast API, which Ramirez thought, that's kind of odd, because I created Fast API about one and a half years ago. So even the creator couldn't have four years of experience with Fast API because uh, it just hasn't been around that long. I, I, th these are funny. Uh, they, they probably really don't mean that much other than somebody's using a template who doesn't understand the skills. And I don't think that's a shocker to people. Right. Uh, but it but it does show that these years of experience in, in job descriptions are essentially meaningless. Like, obviously, nobody's paying attention to this because very quickly, the hiring managers would interview someone and say, how many years of Kubernetes experience you do you have? And someone would say, well, six, because that's the most you can have. Uh, they're not going to say, well, we can't we can't consider your, your application anymore because you need 12, and that's impossible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, I don't know. I mean, I, I sometimes wonder, you know, as you look at a, a variety of jobs, you know, you could be in variety of, of, of industries and disciplines, the whole kind of like, here's how many years or more we'd like you to have, you know, just to be, you know, uh, considered qualified on any level. I mean, that's all, it's pretty fluid. Um, Actually, you know, Captain Jack uh, points out something. Maybe it just means they don't expect to be able to hire anyone for six years. So they're like, you know, <laughs> right. when someone has 12 years of experience, you're going to have 12 by the decision. time we hire you if you're good yeah, at this. Yeah, it's going to be a long process. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, these, these, it just shows that that people slap these numbers in here without really meaning them, which is unfortunate. Or or it's a um, uh, honeypot to catch time travelers. Oh, very good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Well, listen, if you can time travel, you're probably right for the job. <laughs> that's probably true. See, that's, it's a way to weed people out. <laughs> Arivo has announced what it calls the world's first 3D printed unibody electric bike. Uh, yes, you're correct. Arivo is an industrial printer, uh, not a bicycle maker, but they're making some very interesting bikes with their industrial printers. The Superstrata Terra is a custom lightweight frame and Superstrata Ion, a class one e-bike with a rear hub 250 watt motor, 252 watt battery and an estimate or watt hour battery and an estimated 60 miles of range. Arivo prints the frames as a single continuous thermoplastic carbon fiber unibody. So no welding. That's the key here is you don't have those stress points. 
The Terra frame weighs around 2.8 pounds, and the Ion 24.2 with all the extras, uh, or the Ion with all the extras weighs about 24.2 pounds. The frames have no downpipe from the seat to the pedals. They're very interesting. Customers can send in their measurements and have the bike printed to fit. Each bike takes about 10 hours to create. So they're not going to save money on making these, actually, uh, but they are going to be able to do some cool things that you couldn't do if you assembled them. The bikes were designed by Bill Stevens, not by Arivo. Bill Stevens uh, works for some a place called Studio West Concepts, which has designed frames for Schwinn, Raleigh, Diamond, and Yeti. So he's, he's well known in the industry. Arivo is selling the first round of bikes on Indiegogo at a discount, $1,299 for the uh, Terra and $1,799 for the Ion. Those are promised to ship in December. The price eventually will be $2,799 for the Terra and $3,999 for the Ion. Man, these are the times where I I wish I was a little bit more into bikes. Um, I pulled a couple friends of mine, you know, when I knew we were going to be talking about the story, and I was like, is this cool? And everyone was like, yeah, man, it's not cheap, but it's very cool. Uh, the, you know, the, the idea that, that an e-bike, not just a bike, but an electronic bike, you know, with decent range and some pretty cool specs is getting 3D printed. And yeah, I mean... I don't know, maybe 10 hours will become five hours, you know, as, as the technology gets better, but it's pretty fascinating to me. Roger, you were, you were saying you, you've had some experience with these sorts of things and the, and not having the welding is a big advantage. Not having the welding is a big advantage in that what you were saying, there were stress points. I had a coworker who was riding down a street in San Francisco and and his bike was less than a month old because he ordered it online, and it literally cracked at a joint between the uh, the front of the frame and, and the uh, the main bar, and it cracked at that weld. And so he literally his bike split in two while he was riding, which is a very uh, unsafe proposition. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. But but the other thing is how incredibly light this bike is. Typically, you would need to go carbon fiber, and carbon fibers are usually limited to to race bikes. I have never seen an e bike actually made of that kind of composite material that saves a lot of weight because if you've ever ridden an e-bike and tried to pedal it it's a lot heavier than just a normal bike because you have the weight of the batteries and and mm -hmm. the additional motor i mean the point it's, is the uh, the electric yeah. part of the e-bike makes makes it easier to pedal right yeah and, but it, it just handling wise this whole thing mm -hmm. makes it uh, a lot easier than it would have been if you just did it traditionally so i can definitely see the excitement about it it's also very pricey i mean i I don't have, I don't think anyone, 12, 1300 bucks seems kind of like the limit where people would actually be normally able to spend for a bike. But, you know, at the, the three to four grand, uh, uh, it definitely for the, the people with bigger uh, wallets. Yeah. And that wallet will then weigh them down and outweigh the advantage of the lighter bike because it's so <laughs> full of money. <laughs> but everybody's just going to use, you know, WeChat for everything you don't even need wallet anymore oh right you won't be carrying money right you'll just be paying yeah. with qr code good point I yeah yeah you know come on live in the now <laughs> uh microsoft speaking of living in the now microsoft will spin off its empathetic teenage girl chatbot Zhaois also known as Rina in Japan, into an independent entity. Microsoft will retain a stake in the company and get licensing revenue from Zhaois. Uh, Microsoft also claims that the chatbot has a reach of more than 660 million users on 450 million third-party smart devices in finance, retail, auto, real estate, and fashion industries. Zhaois, or Rina, wants to be your friend, after which it claims it can mind context, tonality, and emotions from text to create unique patterns within seconds. Former Microsoft AI and research executive Harry Shum will serve as chairman of Zhaois, and current GM Li Di will become CEO. Yeah, this is interesting. So a lot of uh, AI royalty in China have have graduated from this, Harry Shum uh, being one of them. Uh, he was a, a Microsoft AI research and, and development executive, but also worked in the Xiaomi subdivision for a while. Uh, a couple of the big names at Baidu, like their COO, have come out of Xiaomi. So this is, this is a big deal. It's an impressive 
uh, use of AI to to emulate empathy, uh, which is something a little harder for these chatbots to do sometimes. Uh, you you know, depending on on what culture you come from, may find the teenage girl aspect a little disconcerting. Uh, but that that is sort of a common marketing trope. Uh, in a lot of mm. these markets, and and it's used in finance, retail, real estate. Like uh, this is this is not just your buddy, although it is sometimes referred to as your virtual girlfriend. Uh, it's providing like actual customer support uh, in these situations. I think what's most interesting about this, though, is the fact that Microsoft feels like it's better for them to spin this off, still get the licensing money, uh, still get the benefit uh, from it, but not have it be part of their company if it's going to operate in China. Folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Oh, did someone mention China? Uh, <laughs> we mentioned Friday that Amazon sent an email to employees requiring them to uninstall TikTok from mobile devices that also received Amazon company email. Later Friday, in fact, during Good Day Internet, after DTNS, uh, Amazon announced that that email was sent in error and there was, in fact, no change in policy regarding TikTok. Well, that was odd enough, right? It was like, oh, well, then how did it get sent? Well, that's weird. Why'd you even compose it in the first place? That's weird. However, Saturday, Wells Fargo sent an email to its employees asking its employees to remove TikTok from corporate devices due to, quote, concerns about TikTok's privacy and security controls and practices, and because corporate-owned devices should be used for company business only. They're like, we're worried about the security, and besides, you shouldn't be on TikTok when you're supposed to be working. <laughs> Also over the weekend, the Democratic National Committee's security team here in the United States wrote in an email, we continue to advise campaign staff to refrain from using TikTok on personal devices. If you are using TikTok for campaign work, we recommend using a separate phone and account because they're like, we know you need to campaign on TikTok because it's the hot thing, but don't use your same account. We're worried about it. In fact, the DNC had previously sent a memo warning against TikTok use in December at that point in that memo, they cited Chinese ties and potentially sending data back to the Chinese government. The Republican National Committee came out saying it has a longstanding recommendation that employees and stakeholders not download the TikTok app, citing security concerns. And as we mentioned on Friday, TikTok is trying to address those concerns. It's considering spinning TikTok out as a subsidiary with its own board and headquarters outside of China. Remember, TikTok is operated out of Santa Monica, California, where its CEO, a former Disney executive, Kevin Mayer, a U.S. citizen, uh, runs the show. But TikTok is owned by ByteDance, and ByteDance is headquartered in Beijing. And in TikTok was created... Uh, by an acquisition of Musical.ly, which was started in Shanghai. So there are definitely Chinese roots. But what has TikTok actually done to cause these concern security concerns? Well, we've mentioned before, checking clipboard contents regularly. But that's something that PUBG Mobile, the New York Times, and LinkedIn were also found to be doing. Uh, so it must not be just that. Uh, we're not seeing you know, people calling for the banning of LinkedIn from RNC phones. Collect a lot of data. That's the one we talked about on Friday with Alyssa Miller. It collects keystroke data, background location, your installed apps. Also things that almost any game app or advertising-driven app collects. It's not the best, right, that it does this, but it's certainly not the only app that collects this amount of data. But people are like, why does TikTok need to collect it and why don't they make it more transparent that they do? The argument against TikTok runs that, yes, it collects a lot of data that other apps collect, but this could be used by Chinese intelligence to surveil specific users. Now, TikTok says, no, it won't. Our data is stored outside of China. We will not respond to requests to hand over data to the Chinese government, and we have never been asked to do so. Also, let's compare this to other companies that have actually been caught putting their data in China or been caught losing their data to potential state-backed actors. Zoom got caught routing conferences through China, remember. Equifax lost data for more than 100 million people. Some people think that the attackers that got the Equifax data were based in Russia. TikTok has not been caught doing anything as serious as that, but the concerns about TikTok are greater. Zoom and Equifax are not owned by Chinese companies. This is all about the ownership. 
or is it? There's also examples of Chinese companies that don't get this level of scrutiny. Tencent's WeChat is used by more than a million users in the United States. You never hear about that. It regularly surveils its users. It censors sensitive topics. Not much call to get WeChat off phones, but maybe it's because the RNC and the DNC and the Wells Fargo employees aren't using it. What about PUBG Mobile, though? PUBG Mobile, it's no Fortnite, but it's pretty popular. It's owned by Tencent, same company that owns WeChat. It got caught looking at your clipboard. No calls to ban PUBG or remove it from phones. The Verge notes that the play here may be to do with the U.S. Committee on Foreign Investments trying to do what it did with Grindr force TikTok to be divested from its Chinese parent company. Remember, they did that with Grindr. They said, you can't own Grindr anymore. Grindr got spit off. Maybe they're saying, look, TikTok is popular enough. We want to get it out of hand because it's going to stay popular. Mm, would we see the same happen to PUBG Mobile? Maybe. Would we see it happen to WeChat? Mm, I doubt it. The move used to be to have a service for China and a service for the rest of the world, right? Like, if we're going to be a Chinese company, we'd have one for China, Du Yen, in TikTok's case, and one for the rest of the world, TikTok. But TikTok's becoming an example where even that might not work. We're... Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I mean, lot to unpack. Lot to unpack. So if for some reason, if, if you are in the camp of, listen, if ByteDance, parent company, originated in China then nothing TikTok does or says or where their Santa Monica headquarters are or who their CEO is will, will convince us that this is a safe company. Okay, fine. If you feel that way, then the company would have to, yeah, completely, well, not dismantle, but, you know, they're, they're, it would have to restructurize. But there are so many other instances, as you mentioned, Tom, of other companies that either have been found to do similar things uh, or have have kind of slid past uh, scrutiny by doing similar things. My, you know, the, I, my optimistic side is like, this is all good because all this does is shed more light on what lots of companies do, whether they are Chinese companies or a company that originates in many other places. And the way that uh, companies operate at times is uh, by using data collection that is way above and beyond what most of their users would be comfortable with and the users just don't know. So this is a good thing. You know, we're learning more about how this stuff works. But again, yeah, like something like TikTok, you're not gonna get a bunch of young people, predominantly TikTok users, saying, oh, data collection, well, that doesn't sound good. I'm gonna delete the app. It, that's not gonna happen. So this whole surveil thing, you know, there, there's a lot more to this whole story of how you educate people on what's actually going on and how, and moreover, how you get them to care. Yeah, I, th I think uh, TikTok is the nail that stands out a little higher than the rest. I mean, Lenovo uh, has headquarters in North Carolina, Hong Kong, and Beijing. It's a Chinese company. Even though it lists its main headquarters at Hong Kong, it did that a long time ago to kind of take some of the pressure, but it still has a headquarters in Beijing. Uh, it also has a US office. I think TikTok's looking at that and saying, we want to be like that. I don't know if it fixes that because Lenovo, even though there have been some, some data handling issues with Lenovo, it's generally not handling a lot of your data. TikTok is. Uh, it's generally not seen as a company targeted at your children. TikTok is. So I think the fact that it is Chinese hugely popular social network that isn't based in the United States and it's used by your children and is just getting more and more popular. I think that's what causes it to attract this attention. Well, um, hopefully you can uh, join our Discord if you haven't already and you know kick around some of these ideas because these are complex uh, complex stories. You can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS and talk to the DTNS family. What's in the mailbag, Sarah? Well, Tom, I'm glad you asked because we've got a good one from Sam in Belgium who had thoughts on our discussion about Android updates and the Google Pixel phones being the safest bet to be sure to get updates. Sam says, problem with that is that Google doesn't even sell the Pixels everywhere. In fact, last year I was considering buying the Pixel 4 XL, but Google doesn't sell it in Belgium. They sell it in the German Google store. You can't order it from Belgium, though. Then I noticed that at Media Market in Germany sells it, so I was considering that. But it was right before Black Friday. I waited a little bit to see if there were any discounts. It was heavily discounted in the U.S., 
but not in Germany. So I decided to go for the OnePlus 7T Pro, seeing that Google doesn't seem to be really interested in selling me their devices. Come on, Google. People in Belgium wanted your phone. Yeah. What, what's up with that? It's Europe, for goodness sake. You're selling it in Germany. Uh, yeah, that is annoying, Sam. Thanks for the, uh, I, I like getting these localized insights like this. Like, y'all in Germany with your pixels think everything's easy, but it ain't so easy over here in Belgium. <laughs> not, not in neighboring Belgium, that's for sure. Um, yeah, thanks for letting us know, Sam. And yeah, keep those... Keep those on the ground reports coming to us because it always helps us to know um, how everybody's faring. Hey, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Philip Shane, Wandy Hernandez, and Paul Thiessen. Also, thanks to everybody who supports us at Patreon, patreon.com slash DTNS. You get all kinds of perks there. It's the best way to directly support the show. It funds the majority of what we do, and it does it so that we're accountable to you and no one else. If you get value out of the show, we just ask that you get that value back at patreon.com slash DTNS. We'll give you an RSS feed that doesn't have ads in it. We'll give you extra content from Shannon Morris about security, uh, from me about how we run the show, a column from Roger, uh, Sarah's Live With It, looking at gadgets. That's all available as a Patreon. Go check it out at patreon.com slash DTNS. And if you have feedback for us, we'd love to hear it. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send those emails. We're also live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC, and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Patrick Beja. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>